So Romans 6, verse 15, what then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But thank God that, although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over and have been set free from sin. You became enslaved to righteousness. I'm using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh, but just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So the question is, the question is, should we go on sinning? It's a very simple question. Last week, we got a simple answer to that question. No, no, we should not go on sinning. Why not? Well, in, in Romans 6, 1 through 14, we learn it's because everyone who has put their faith in Jesus has been united with him. They have died to sin with him, died to sin, and been raised with Jesus to new life, a new life of freedom. And we're, that's the series we're in now, and that's what we've been talking about and we'll continue to talk about for the next few weeks as we work through Romans 6 and 7. And, and, and there, as we saw last week, Paul pleads with believers and with us, agree with God. Agree with God about what he said about you. Don't submit to sin, submit to him. Live out your new life in Christ, not under law, but under grace. You are justified, you're right with God. Live like that is true, because it is true. <laughs> it is true. This week, we're looking again as uh, Paul raises an almost identical question, but if we aren't under law, if we aren't under law, if the penalty of the law doesn't apply to believers anymore, my relationship is, is secure in Christ, why not go on sinning? Why not go on, go on sinning? He presses that, and he gives another simple answer, because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. That's why. That's, that's our passage here in a nutshell. Now, as we begin this morning, um, our goal here is the same as it was for Paul uh, among the Roman believers. We want you to live in freedom. We want to live in freedom, free from the slavery of sin, free from the destruction of it. There is real life in Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't just die to save you from sin and death. He rose again to give you a whole new life. And when we talk about the gospel, it's not just a ticket to heaven. It's not just fire insurance. It's not just a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's life. This is life, here and now. This is the good life, the blessed life. This is freedom. And, and I don't know if you're someone who's thought of your relationship with Jesus as just that sort of ticket to heaven, fire insurance sort of thing. You know what I'm talking about? But listen, thinking, thinking I, I, I don't know how else to put this. Thinking that the gospel is just a ticket to heaven is like saying marriage is just a license to sleep together. I don't mean to make this weird, but that's the consummation of the relationship. That's not all there is to marriage. Right? If you think that way, I'm, I'm telling you, you're going to have a bad marriage. <laughs> if you reduce your entire view of marriage down to just that, you're going to have a terrible marriage. If you reduce what Jesus has done down just to a ticket to heaven, you've missed a key understanding of what Jesus has done for you and, and what kind of relationship he wants to have with you. You miss the salvation, the freedom Jesus has purchased for you here and now. So please hear me this morning. Please, please listen to the scripture. Please listen to what the Lord has to tell us. I want to do two things today. Uh, first, I want to look at the simple message of this passage, which again is, is summarized, I think, very, very beautifully and succinctly in verse 23. 
So I want to do that first, but then I want to go a layer deeper and look at three key things woven through this whole section that you must understand if you want to not only see why you must be free of sin, but how the gospel of Jesus Christ works in you to bring that about. Okay, so first, first the simple message. The big question is, should we, should we sin because we're not under law? That's, that's the root of it. Should we sin because we are not under law? And he says, absolutely not. Why not? First of all, because the wages of sin is death, and we could add, even if you're not under law. Even if you're not under law. Here in Romans 6, we talk about the, new, the, the life of a believer. After they put their faith in Christ, they are dead to sin, no longer under law. But even apart from the law, sin still brings suffering and death into the world. Did you know that? You probably know that. You probably know that. We see it every day. But let me show you here in Romans. Uh, let me read for you from Romans 5. This is just the previous chapter, almost the, the near context here. Romans 5, verses 12 to 14. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all sinned. In fact, sin was in the world before the law. But sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless... Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. What's that mean? Sin brought suffering and death even without the law. Sin brings death even if you aren't under law. Are you tracking with that? Uh, let me show you this in two ways. First in the biblical story and then from daily life. Uh, first of all, in, in the biblical story, in, in Leviticus 18.18, 18, there's a law of uh, not a well-known law, but there's a law. It says a man shouldn't marry a woman and her sister because it will create a rivalry, okay? And then in verse 29, it says the penalty for doing that is to be cut off from the people of Israel, okay? Now, here's your Bible trivia for the day. Uh, can you think of a patriarch who did exactly that? Anybody? Jacob, you're on it. Good job, gold star. Jacob married Leah and her sister Rachel. Now, under the law, Jacob should have been cut off from the people of Israel, which is ironic because Jacob is Israel, right? Uh, that's his name. <laughs> um, but we say, well, no, no, hold on, hold on, Jared, right? The law wasn't given yet. Jacob's not under the law. Uh, and, and besides, Jacob was deceived into marrying them both, um, sort of. But. So, so the penalty of the law doesn't apply to him. Okay, okay, the penalty of the law doesn't apply to Jacob. So everything's fine. Have you read the story of what happened in Jacob's life when he did this? No. In fact, you go and you read about the havoc and the pain and the destruction that came as a result of him marrying those two women. And the rivalry between them didn't just bring pain in their generation. It got passed on to their children. It wasn't fine. Why? Because sin brings death even if you aren't under law. Okay? Uh, driving, uh, Clyde, help me out. Driving 150 miles per hour at night what, what's going to happen to you in the state of Oregon if you get caught? <laughs> You're getting arrested, right? The law is coming down on you. Uh, yes, you'll get arrested if it doesn't kill you first, right? Now, there are places in the world uh, where driving like that won't get you arrested, but it will still get you killed. Yes? Why? Because there's a higher law, a deeper law at work in reality. In the case of driving recklessly, we call that law physics, right? <laughs> With or without road signs and cops, physics still applies. Here in Romans 6, Paul is trying to explain to frankly naive Christians the physics of sin, how it works, the principle behind it. But also there is now a new principle at work for everyone who's put their faith in Jesus. Yes, sin brings death, even if you aren't under a law, but obedience leads to experiencing life, true life, true freedom. And last week, we, we talked about how the secular world defines freedom as doing whatever you want, freedom from all restrictions, right? You want to get drunk? Get drunk. Be free. You want to sleep around? Be free. You want to spend your life living for yourself? Be free. Again, that's the, world, the way the world defines it. Freedom, according to the world, is being without restrictions. But then I also use the illustration of the fish in the pond, right? Because by that definition, uh, if a fish leaps out of the water onto the lawn, he's living in freedom. Free from restrictions, free from the restrictions of the pond, and yet that kind of freedom only brings death. And if it leads to death, is it really freedom? 
No, because true freedom depends on knowing what we were made for. For the fish, that's the water. In the water, it can breathe and swim and thrive. God's word tells us you were made for something too. The water for you is relationship with God, and it's only when you're living in communion with him that you can really breathe and move and thrive. Does that make sense? Here in our text, Paul is trying to show that obedience to God leads to life, that being confined, as it were, to our relationship with God, the relationship you were really made for, is actually true freedom because it leads to true life. Make sense? Sin leads to death. Obedience leads to life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And again, it's naive as Christians to think there are now no consequences to sin or to ignore the gift God has given us and think, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that when I die. You're missing real life now. You're missing freedom now, living like a slave when you've been called a son. And with the rest of our time this morning, I want to go a layer deeper because this is so important. We need to see this. We need to understand this down to the root of it. Paul uses an analogy here to help us understand. I, I said before, Paul is going to explain the physics, as it were, of sin, or like the illustration of the fish, uh, we could talk about the biology of spiritual life in Christ. Here in Romans 6, 15 to 23, Paul illustrates how sin works and how our new life in Christ works using the analogy of slavery. Okay? Now, in verse 19, he's clear this is an analogy. This is not an endorsement of slavery. He's simply using something the Romans would have understood to illustrate how sin works in our lives and why we must be free of it. So he uses the analogy of slavery in contrast uh, three things, okay? These are in your notes, and we'll put them up on the screen. Two rulers. Two rulers, that's sin or God. There are two results, that's death or life, and two kinds of relationships based on wages or on a gift. Got that? Those are, those are points today. You have them in your notes. Again, they're on the screen. If you want to understand what Jesus has done for us, not just in terms of freeing us from the penalty of sin, but freeing us from sin's power and how to live in that freedom, you need to understand those three things. Two rulers, two results, under two kinds of relationships. So let's look at that. First of all, two rulers. Verse 16 says, Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Okay? Two rulers, two rulers, two masters, only two. Right? Notice it says, either... You are a slave to sin or a slave to obedience to God. Either or. There are two rulers, two masters, and it's not a matter of if we will serve. It's only a matter of who we will serve. It's either or. There's no third option. There are no free agents. Uh, there has never been a human being who is truly autonomous. And so when the Bible talks about freedom, it's always a change of master, a change of rulers, Transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. We either serve what is true or what is false, either Pharaoh or Yahweh. It's either sin or God. In, in a sense, you either live in the pond or you flop around on the grass, right? But, but listen, everyone serves something. Everyone worships. Everyone worships. Earlier in the year, as we went through Genesis 11, I read for you something by um, David Foster Wallace, who was a, he was a secular writer and thinker. But in a now very famous commencement address at Kenyon College, he said this, he says, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only thing is who we worship. That's true. That's true. It's shocking that a secular writer and thinker could, could recognize something that sometimes Christians don't even see. Everybody worships. The question is, who do you worship? Everyone serves something, and either you are a slave to sin or a slave to God, but everyone serves. Can I ask you this morning, who do you serve? Who do you serve? Maybe, maybe we should also ask, how would I know? <laughs> how would I know? I, I know what I want to say, but how do I know who I'm actually living in service to? Well, there's a couple things that can help us to answer that question, okay? Okay couple things that we can actually learn here. First, it's helpful to know what slavery is. 
Now, now praise God, uh, we're removed in personal experience from the institution of slavery. But like I said last week, the, the Roman church would have found the analogy of slavery a very vivid one because upwards of 60% of them were either current or former slaves. So maybe this doesn't have to be explained to them, but it's helpful for us to understand that slavery is about two things. Slavery is about status and control. In terms of status, uh, slaves had vastly lower status than their masters. They were viewed as subhuman, and therefore they had few, if any, rights. And because of that, the master has complete control over their slave. The slave is treated as, as property, like a tool to be used or discarded, which means the master holds the power of life and death. The life of the slave was in their hands, which gives the master complete control in their life. You say, well, okay, how does that help me to understand of the slavery of sin and, and identify who I'm serving in life. Someone once said, you know, the problem with my sin is that it doesn't feel like sin. It feels like life. The problem with my sin is that it doesn't feel like sin. It feels like life. Sin feels like life. It feels like the thing I have to have in order to truly live. Uh, in the garden, when the serpent tempted Eve, it wasn't with evil. It was with the promise of good the promise of life apart from God. She was tempted to sin because the fruit appeared good like real life. But she was deceived into thinking God had her under his thumb, that she was less than without this one thing. So listen, whatever, whatever it is that you feel like you have to have in order to be okay, to be enough, to finally live, that thing holds your life and therefore it controls you. Practically speaking, that becomes your master, your Lord. And you will find yourself doing whatever it demands. Like we said earlier, God was meant to be that for us from the beginning. God is the water of our souls, where we can breathe and move and thrive, relationship with him. When anything else takes that place in your life, it's what we call an idol. Anything we serve other than God himself becomes sin to us. So let me ask you, is there something you look to and think, you know, if I had that, I'd have real life? If I had that, I'd finally be satisfied and have peace and contentment. As you think about that, let me, let me give you a few examples. Um, you know, if you find yourself feeling snubbed and slighted, underappreciated, listen, that can happen. Uh, people, people overlook us. People look down on us. They don't always appreciate the things we do. It's not wrong to feel bad when that happens. But when you find yourself growing more and more bitter about it, when you begin to fight to gain approval and praise, when you find you aren't okay until you get that, you need it. And so you begin to say and do things you know aren't loving or kind. They don't look like Christ. You insert yourself into things uh, you know you really shouldn't. You worry constantly about what others are saying about you. Pride drives you to find ways of putting yourself into the spotlight when you know you shouldn't be there. Well, those are signs that approval of others has begun to control you. Let me give you another example. There are some of you who've been in a place in life when unless and until you had a man or woman who adores you, you couldn't be okay. You didn't just want to be in a romantic relationship, married or not. You got to the place where you thought you needed that. And so you compromised on whether or not it was the right person, the right time, or the right way to go about it. And, and you also know that, I mean, our world has made available all sorts of cheap substitutes to God's plan for marriage, and many have gone after those things. Why? Because desire, passion, romantic love can become a master, a lord. And, the, you know, the poets and the songwriters of the world would be without a job if that wasn't an idol of our culture. But it's a cruel master, it is. And you know, living under that doesn't just bring you grief, the other person is gonna get smothered, <laughs> crushed under the weight of your need. No one but God himself can handle the needs of your heart. Maybe you figure, you know what my real problem is? My bank account is empty. <laughs> yeah, I, I could be kinder and gentler and more honest and more faithful and more selfless if I only had a little money. <laughs> And you find money, you know, getting it, keeping it, fantasizing about what you'll do with it once it comes to you. Because, you, you, you know, you'll really be able to live once you get that. Listen, it controls you. It controls you. Practically speaking, money rules you. And as Jesus said, you can either serve God or money, never both. 
You're anxious, you're angry. Could it be that as you sense how little control you have over the circumstances in your life and in your world, that your anxiety and your anger are the symptoms of a deeper issue, the idolatry of power? I can't control this world, I can't control the people around me, I can't control what's going to happen next, and so we become a slave to our fears or a slave to our anger. In all these cases, it's only a matter of time before we can see these masters, these idols, take their toll physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. They bring damage to your relationships with others. And that is actually the second way you can know who you're serving, is to look at what is being produced through your life. Throughout this passage, Paul links slavery to sin with impurity, greater and greater lawlessness, and then death. And then he links obedience to life. See, because the two masters, sin or God, bring two different results, death or life. And that's our second point, two results. There's a book uh, by G.K. Beale called We Become What We Worship. And uh, this is his thesis statement. He says, what you revere, you resemble, either for ruin or for restoration. And, and in the book, Beale traces that idea through the Bible. We become what we worship. Now, we already said everybody worships something. Everyone serves a master. The question isn't just who that will be. The question is, where will that lead? What will that produce in us? Because we become like what we serve. It's true. It's true. Uh, let me read for you Psalms 115. We'll put it up on the screen. We can read it. You can follow along. Their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell, they have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, they cannot make a sound with their throats. Verse 8, those who make them, that's idols, will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. We become like who or what we serve. We become like who or what we serve. And those examples I gave earlier of various idols of the heart, the ways in which we find ourselves enslaved to sin. You know, when you serve an idol of control, it will shape you into a controlling person, rigid and inflexible. When you serve an idol of approval from people, it will make you weak and flimsy, <laughs> constantly trying to play the chameleon. When you serve an idol of beauty and sexual allure, it will leave you shallow and empty. In Romans 1, we saw that play out where it says, humans exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and then of animals and beasts. And they began to live more and more like what they worshipped. They exchanged the truth of a lie. And, and following foolishness, they became foolish. They became fools. We become like what we worship and serve. I read for you a portion of that speech uh, from David Foster Wallace uh, let me read for you a bit more. And again, this shocks me because, again, this is a secular thinker and writer, but as he observes the world, uh, he has more insight about this sometimes than, than Christians do, sadly. He says, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only, church, only choice we get is what to worship. An outstanding reason for choosing God, for example, to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. The insidious things about these forms of worship is they are unconscious, and the world will not discourage you from operating like this because the world of men and money and power hums along quite nicely on the fuel of fear and contempt and frustration and craving and the worship of self. Our own present culture has harnessed these forces in ways that have yielded extraordinary wealth and comfort and personal freedom. The freedom to be lords of our own tiny skull-sized kingdoms, alone at the center of all creation. Can I plead with you? Can I plead with you? Do not ignore sin in your life. Please hear what God is saying here. Your sin is killing you. 
It's killing the people that you love. It's destroying this world. But can I also plead with you to listen? Because here's the good news. This cuts both ways. This principle works both ways. You become like what you serve. Sin leads to death, yes. And yet, for the believer, it's as Paul says in verse 17, but thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. When you put your faith in Christ and obey the call to believe the gospel, you were given over to a new master. There's an interesting phrase there, and it's, it's easy to misread. Uh, he said, although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. Now, I know if you're looking in your King James, it's like, uh, I, that's not quite the same. There's a reason for that. If you want to ask about that, I can tell you later. What our, flames, our, our brains do is flip this around and think, obeyed from the heart the teaching which was handed over to you. That's not what it says. Most commentators, scholars, and, and the majority of translations have it this way. This, is, this I believe, is, is what is intended. It says, you obeyed from the heart the teaching to which you were handed over. So most commentators agree that in the first place, Paul is saying you obeyed from the heart the gospel, which means you believed. But the second part is more interesting because unlike, for example, the, the teachings of the rabbis who saw themselves as masters of their teaching, it belongs to them. They own it, they control it. For a follower of Jesus, when you believe the gospel, it masters you. You belong to the gospel now. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God's hand, God hands you over to this plan, the gospel, this message. You were bought with a price and given over to it. Where does that lead? Where does that take us? In Romans 8, and James is going to begin taking us through Romans 8 in a few weeks. Few weeks. In Romans 8, there's a promise that those who are in Christ, and this whole process of where the gospel is taking you, those who are in Christ are destined to be conformed to the image of his son. You become like the one you serve, the one you worship. And Jesus is life, true life, true freedom. In John 8, Jesus said, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son remains forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you really will be free. So if you're, if you're here this morning, or you're listening to this, and you look at your life, and you want to be free, to be free of sin's penalty, to be free of sin's power, the answer is the same. Come to Jesus and ask him to set you free. This morning, as you look at your life and see, you know, there's something here, something I won't let go of, something I can't let go of, call out to him and ask him to set you free. Last thing, you say, Jared, you know, I... I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do I see the differences. I see what sin brings. You, you, you don't have to convince me, I know. But to live free of it, to live this out, I, I don't know how. I don't have it in me to obey. He says, offer myself to righteousness. I, 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 I don't have that in me. It's our last point. Living this out all comes down to understanding the relationship we can have with God and Jesus Christ. We need to see there isn't just a difference in who we serve or what that service will do in us but why we now serve. Is it for wages or is it from a gift? That's our last point, two relationships. Remember before we said that slavery was about two things, status and control, remember that? The status of the slave determines the kind of control the master could hold over them. The fact that the slaves were considered subhuman meant their master could treat them however they wanted. And sin is a cruel master. It will work every one of its slaves to death. But God deals with those who are his completely differently. Completely differently. As soon as you come into the household of God, he doesn't lower your status. He immediately raises it. He raises you to the position of son. In Roman law, we know that it was possible to adopt a slave directly into the family. It was very rare, uh, but it happened. And this would have been a complete and total gift no slave could earn that. But when that's done, the master immediately becomes father. Now listen, you obey 
your master and you obey your father, but you obey them for two very different reasons. You obey your master to save your neck, because if you don't, he'll toss you out. You obey your father because he loves you, and he'll never toss you out. I once heard a, a, a preacher tell a story about this. He said he'd, he'd met a man who ran an orphanage and a school for delinquent boys, and this was back when they called boys delinquents. Um, the man said there was, there was one boy in particular uh, who remained stubborn and rebellious no matter what the schoolmaster did. They tried everything. Uh, tried everything they could to help that boy learn to behave. And all sorts of things uh, that all the other... It, it worked with all the other boys. Um, didn't work with him. Right? Just giving them encouragement and praise or holding a strict line and expecting them to rise to the challenge. It, it didn't matter what approach they took. The boy, this boy never responded. Until one day, the schoolmaster asked him if he could do one last thing. He would like to adopt the boy. So that, that from that day forward, he would carry his name. He would be bound together with him as a family. And the boy agreed, and he became that man's son. Now, do you suppose the boy's behavior changed overnight? No. No, and the schoolmaster said his son wasn't a perfectly obedient child after that, but now he wanted to be. He wanted to become, to be in his daily life, what his adoption had made him already, a loved child. There's a, there's a word here in this passage, sanctif sanctification. We sang it in the song, sanctified. Lord, make me a sanctuary. Set me apart. Sanctification, what's that all about? Some have called it becoming who we are in Jesus. The process of becoming the kind of people God has made us in Jesus Christ. Now listen, the order, and listen very carefully, the order of events here matters. The order of events here makes all the difference between a religion of works and the gospel of grace. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. If that man had said, listen, if you start to shape up, live right, there's a place for you at my dinner table among my children. So you start behaving and then we'll talk, right? That, folks, is what so many people assume God is saying. Live right and then I'll accept you. The gospel is the exact opposite. God says, I've accepted you. You are my child. The document is signed and sealed. You have my name. You have a seat at the table. Faith. Faith in Christ. Justified in him. You are his child. You have my name. You have a seat at the table. Now, now, now that you are my beloved child, I want to help you to live like what you are. And the Spirit of God gets to work in us so that we find we also begin to want that. Not driven to perform by the dread of being tossed out, right? Not motivated by fear and dread, but drawn to obey by love and grace. Not out of duty, but out of choice. Amen? As the servers prepare for communion this morning, are you, are you wrestling with sin? You need Jesus. You want to know true freedom? You need him. I, I said earlier that it was rare for masters to adopt slaves into their households. You know what pretty much never happened? Never happened? Masters never adopted a slave as a child when he already had an heir. Why would he? If the master already had a son, an heir, why would he adopt a slave as his child? Folks, Jesus Christ is the son and heir who is willing to leave his seat at the father's table, come here and be handed over, to be beaten and whipped and treated as less than human, to be subject to all the abuses and cruelties of sin and pay its full penalty, death. And he purchased your freedom and gave you a place in his family as a free gift that we would have what he has. To be sons, to sit at the father's table. What will you do with that gift? Receive it, cherish it, and learn who this father of yours is. Not what he wants from you, but what he wants for you. Go to, go to him, ask him, what do you want for me? And offer yourself in his service. That's, that's true freedom. We have an open table. If you're trusting in Jesus as your savior, then you are welcome to eat with us this morning. I'm gonna pray. Please wait so that we can uh, eat as a family at the end. Let's pray. Father God, we, we, look, we look at what you have accomplished 
what you have said in your word. Lord, we look at what you've done for us, and we are amazed. We're set in awe. You, you have told us that everyone who has placed their faith in Christ is right with you. That's true, and we agree with you. And you've also told us, Lord, that not only have you set the record that way, but you are at work in us, that we have died to sin, we're alive in Christ, your spirit now indwells us. Lord, help us to live as what you said we are, to live as your children, obedient to you. Lord, if, if any one of us here is, is wrestling with sin, would you highlight it, would you point it out? And Lord, would you dethrone it? You are life. There's nothing this world can offer um, that can sustain us. Lord, we're looking to you. We thank you again for what you've done. You've given us your very life, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.